First, I'd like to thank the CX Energy Conference organizers. They're doing a really outstanding job. And thanks to you all for attending my talk. Um, just a heads up, this is my first time in Vegas, and it makes me really thirsty. Um, I'm from DC, so when you take me out of the swamp, it just messes up my body. So I need like a plant mister or something. Just um, So I, my name is Kelly Kidwell, and I work at Jensen Hughes in Arlington. It's a basically the city across the river from Washington, DC. And I'm a fire protection engineer and security consultant there. I went to Maryland for fire protection engineering, actually. It's one of the few programs in the country that does undergrad. Um, so I do design. So this entire presentation is kind of from the design side. I'm not an installer. Um, I don't do commissioning, so I will witness the acceptance testing, but just to give you guys an idea of where I'm coming from here. Um, and if you have any questions, just feel free to raise your hand. I'll try and find you as I'm going, because I think that's just easier to ask questions as we're going. AIA requirement. So what we're first going to do is um, become familiar with the design, the design standard, the background and the history of NFPA 92. Then we are going to understand the design objectives, the design approaches, and design criteria, um, which are really important for smoke control systems. Then we're going to go over the testing procedures, um, how they're determined, and how that is unique to NFPA 92. And then lastly, we'll go over the code changes and how they're going to affect design and commissioning um, in 2018 adoptions of the code. So moving on to slide six. Um, before we dive into NFPA 92 itself, I want to go over some definitions of terms, um, just because I believe it's important to be on the same page with everyone, especially coming from all different backgrounds and disciplines. I've seen it in the field a lot of times. You get miscommunications um, between different folks who may not use the same words to describe the same things all the time, between designers, installers, and different contractors. So just a few <coughs> quick definitions. Um, so smoke control, what is it exactly? Uh, we already talked about it a lot, um, but it's an engineering system that includes all methods, singly or in combination, that modify smoke movement. And basically you can take smoke control and boil it down to tenability. Um, whether it's going to be indefinitely or for a set amount of time in one smoke zone um, or besides the zone of origin of the fire, it all boils down to tenability. And we're gonna define that a little bit later in a couple slides. And you can probably infer what I mean by it right now, just out of context. These are just some prime examples of buildings that you might see a smoke control system in. So just kind of rolling up to the building or you know, signing a new contract, what am I gonna be commissioning here? Um, if the building has a large atrium, a very tall atrium, it might not be large on the first floor, but it might extend many, many stories. That's kind of a dead giveaway that you're gonna have a smoke control system to deal with. Um, or you could have a smaller atrium just with multiple levels and, um, sorry, multiple levels, maybe balconies, um, lots of places for occupants to walk around and creating a unique geometry for smoke to get entrapped or, you know, um, fun stuff that could burn that kind of thing. And then you also have high rises. Those are going to have different kinds of smoke management or smoke control systems. They might include stair pressurization, elevator lobby pressurization, which this building actually has. If you go, you have smoke protected elevator lobbies on every floor. Um, wand doors, fun. And then um, increasingly you're seeing occupant evacuation elevators and those elevator shafts require pressurization. So these are all types of um, buildings where you are going to probably run into smoke control in one way or another. So slide eight, there are two design approaches for smoke control systems. One is containment and one is management. And in a single building, you can have one or both. Um, so containment is the use of zones and pressure differences to effectively keep smoke from spreading. And some examples of that are stair pressurization, elevator shaft pressur pressurization, 
um, pressurized vestibules, and smoke protected areas of refuge. So for the smoke containment systems, in the image, which hopefully you can see on your printouts, um, one side of the wall is positively pressurized and the other side is negatively pressurized and that's where you want to keep the smoke. So people who are in the healthcare industry might be familiar with this for contamination control. It's the same sort of concept, but in fire protection for smoke control, we have a few more applications. I mean, it's effectively the same thing. Smoke is a contaminant. And then for smoke management systems, which is on the right side of that slide, um, you can use natural or mechanical ventilation to remove smoke, maintain tenability, or prevent smoke from moving to a communicating space. So these kind of systems, you, these are what you're gonna see in a large volume area. Smoke management is the type of system that you're gonna see in a large sports arena, shopping malls, in atria, or casinos like this building. Um, and then some smoke control systems are going to use both types of um, design approaches. So I worked on a prison project, just as an example, where each wing was divided into smoke, smoke zones, and then each wing was a two-story space um, that had cells, two stories, and it was open, and then in the middle was a common area, like a day room. And then when there was a, it had a smoke management system for each wing in the common room, and then it also had positive pressure in the other wings. So if a fire was detected in one common room, the exhaust system would activate and that's the management system. And then in the other adjacent smoke zones, they would become positively pressurized because the smoke containment system would activate. Um, so that's just one example where you might have both systems. Another is in high rises, you might have an atrium on the bottom floor or the bottom three fourth floors and then you'll also have stair pressurization systems that are in the stairways that extend all up and down the building. So they're completely non-interlocking systems, except when a fire is detected in the atrium, the atrium exhaust will come on, and then also it will activate the stair pressurization system. So that's another example where you might have two systems in one building. Um, so the distinction between these two design approaches does have implications to the design and the testing of the system. So that's why NFPA 92 separates them out and defines them separately. Um, and as we're also gonna see a little bit later, the history of NFPA 92 um, used to be, it used to be two separate documents that dealt with these two types of systems. So that's why there's still that little bit of separation in 92 now. So we keep mentioning tenability, but here's the definition. Um, environment in which the smoke and heat are limited or otherwise restricted to maintain the impact on occupants to a level that's not life-threatening. Um, the definition attempts to distill a really complicated and hotly debated topic into just one sentence. Um, and there are entire dissertations written about this topic. Um, it's very tricky to research how smoke and fire affect people because you can't just drop a person in a room with a fire and then interview them afterwards and say, so how did that go for you? What were you feeling like? Um, any toxic effects? So there is research ongoing and it's very challenging, um, but it's still hard to define tenability. It's a very tricky equilibrium to kind of calculate for humans because so many things are affecting you at once. You have heat from the fire, you have the toxic products of combustion that are in the smoke. Um, and then for different people in different states, it affects them differently. So if you're sleeping, it'll affect you differently than if you're awake. Your respiration rate's gonna be lower. Your heart rate's gonna be lower. Um, if you are sober, it's going to affect you differently than if you're not sober. So in a, you know, in a casino or a nightclub, that has to go into effect into the design as well. Um, so what's the point? Tenability is important to define and determine at the beginning of a project. So this is something that designers have to pay a lot of attention to and they have to get the buy-in of the authority having jurisdiction, the AHJ. 
um, the code enforcer to make sure that they are going to accept your level of tenability limits that you're placing on your smoke control design. Sorry. So as I mentioned before, um, an FPA 92 is the standard for smoke control system. It is a standard and not a code. So what does that mean? Standards are a recommended design and installation best practice for an overall industry. So you'll see this on an FPA 72, on 13, on 92, it's a standard, not a code. The building code is going to tell you where a smoke control system is required or where these other systems like fire alarm or sprinkler systems are required. So first you need to go to the building codes which are likely at the IVC or NFPA 101 and then you would find out from those codes whether the standard is adopted in your local jurisdiction or not. So as I mentioned before, the NFPA 92 used to be divided into two documents. Um, NFPA 92A was more or less the containment, um, containment system standard, and then 92B was more or less the management system standard. Um, and then the printouts are actually, there was a typo, they were not combined in 2015, they were combined in 2012, so you might just want to cross that out. Um, and then, now that they're combined, um, some people might ask why. I think it was mostly an administrative decision on behalf of NFPA because it streamlines the code library instead of having two very closely related kind of subcodes of each other, or I mean technically not code standards. Um, it saves a lot of kind of time and energy. You have all the same definitions, all the same administrative kind of upfront documentation. So to combine the two makes sense, but then they still have very distinct separations within the design and the testing requirements in NFPA 92. So we're gonna cover some more of that later on in the presentation. So where are smoke control systems present? They're based on um, some of the physical features, and we've kind of gone over this a little bit already, but in atria, in malls, arenas, concert or club venues, indoor theme parks, and high rises are all areas where you're gonna see smoke control systems. Um, and then as far as vertical markets go, de detention and correctional is a huge one for smoke control systems because obviously you have a lot of evacuation challenges. So if the fire alarm goes off, you can't just open all the doors and say, okay, everyone evacuate. Go ahead, prisoners, get out. Um, you have to maintain tenability longer in those cases, or you might even have to maintain it indefinitely. So that is a huge one, a huge area. I've done multiple um, prison, detention, um, smoke control systems. And then healthcare is also another big one. Uh, you have similar evacuation challenges, especially in hospital inpatient areas. If people are incapable of self-preservation, then you have to move them to a new smoke zone and that requires lots of work from the staff in the hospital. So that's another big one for smoke control systems. Um, educational, K through 12 as well as higher ed, you'll tend to see smoke control because they have large assembly spaces. Um, industrial, you tend to see lots of natural smoke ventilation in large warehouses. And then amusement, theme parks, show halls, you have a lot of people in one place, and cultural. Um, think of modern museums that are very open. They have priceless artifacts and works of art that you also wanna protect from smoke. Um, and there's also many people there, so you need to make sure that they are safe. Uh, but the way to truly tell whether smoke, is, smoke control is needed or not is to look at the building codes. Um, this should be pinpointed by the design team early on in the design process, so it shouldn't come as a surprise to anyone. Um, so the design team looks at the locally adopted codes and amendments and how those affect the smoke control design. In the IBC, 
the requirement will likely be found in Chapter 4, um, but they, it may be triggered by some other sections, such as stuff in Chapter 9. Um, and then Section 909 outlines requirements of smoke control systems for the IBC. And then in NFPA 101, Chapters 12 through 43 are the occupancy chapters. So depending on the type of building and whether it's new or existing, such as an office, a hospital, a hotel, a dorm, et cetera. Um, and then section 9.3 outlines the requirements of those systems. So go to chapter four of IBC or chapters 12 to 43 of NFPA 101 to see if smoke control is even required. Okay, so NFPA 92 is 94 pages in total. Would have been cooler if they cut it by two pages, but whatever. Um, it's, so it's a very approachable document from an NFPA standards um, aspect. Only 27 of those pages are the actual code itself. The rest is just appendices. Um, but those are a dense 27 pages. So we're gonna walk through the chapters now. And I'm, I wasn't sure of everyone's familiarity with NFPA codes, so I'm just kind of going to break it down to the very beginner level. Chapters one through three are the same for every NFPA code. So the administration just goes over the scope and applicability of the given document. Chapter two lists all the scientific <coughs> papers and then any other codes and standards that are referenced throughout. Um, and then chapter three goes through definitions of terms that are used throughout the standard. And then I made chapter four bold here because this is where it diverges depending on the document. Um, but the design fundamentals cover the design objectives, the design approaches, and the design criteria for smoke control systems. Continuing on, chapter five explains all the calculations that are required for designing a smoke control system. Um, and it takes up a full third of those 27 pages of the code. So that's a really kind of meaty part of the code that only designers will even care about. Um, chapter six goes over the requirements for the equipment. You can't just install like any old ducts or fans for a smoke control system because they're subjected to heat and smoke, and smoke can tend to be corrosive depending on what you're burning, so you can't just be installing just anything. Um, chapter seven goes over the documentation requirements for the design, which is very important. Every smoke control system needs to have this, and we're gonna, I mean, you're gonna see how important it is over the next couple of slides as well. And then chapter eight is probably the most relevant to people in this room. It's the chapter on testing. And then there are 14 appendices, so you can see why it takes up so much of the code. So this one's not, I added this slide later to help go over the design criteria section. Um, so you may not have this in your printout. Sorry about that. So for a complete design, you have to account for all elements incorporated into this design of the smoke control system. Um, believe it or not, weather plays a large part in smoke control. Um, the ability of, a smoke, of smoke to rise in a large volume space, for instance, if it's a hot day, you're gonna have a hard time because it's hot outside, it's probably hot um, temperature-wise at the ceiling level, and then as soon as that exhaust system kicks on and starts exhausting conditioned air, you might have an even harder time getting that smoke to rise. Um, you also have to account for prevailing winds for the exhaust fan if you need to put some sort of housing around it. Um, stack effect, especially with stair pressurization systems, is very important to account for. Um, and then all this weather data is available through other references and standards, and you can actually look in 92 and see where you can look up that weather data that's generally accepted. Um, and then pressure differences. These are the difference in pressure across doors and spaces between different smoke barriers, and they affect the ability of the smoke control system to operate. So if you're in a healthcare occupancy and you have containment systems, you have to coordinate with that as well 
to make sure that they're not interfering with the smoke control system. And then design fire, we're gonna go over a little bit in the next slide, so I'm just gonna save it for then, but um, that's a big one for the designer. And then smoke movement and airflow. This accounts for how the smoke control system is planned to operate. So are you keeping the smoke all in one zone? Are you trying to exhaust it to the outside? Is it a dedicated system, so only used for smoke control, or is it a non-dedicated system? In which case it would be used for normal HVAC operations, and then in a fire emergency, it would switch over to smoke control functionality. Um, this includes makeup air. It's probably the most common thing that's forgotten in, des in design, and it's also very hard to correct afterwards. So when you're exhausting 100,000 CFM out of an atrium, and you forget, oh, I need to pump an extra 95,000 CFM as makeup air into the bottom, you know, you might blow out some eardrums or, I don't know, hopefully not windows. I don't think that's enough, but you need to account for makeup air. Um, leakage probably isn't going to do it at that point. Um, communicating spaces. How do you prevent smoke from traveling to an adjacent smoke zone, um, especially if you don't have anything at the opening and you're just using airflow? And then fire suppression. It's kind of rare, but if you have a gaseous fire su suppression system, um, like an energen system, or basically any type of system that when it's activated, it expands a lot of air in a short period of time to fill a room, that can also interfere with the smoke control system's design. And then last but not least, we have the system operation. Um, so you have to take into account the limitations of smoke control. You're going to have a startup time. It's not just automatically going to detect a fire and then boom, full capacity. It's going to take a couple of seconds to wind up. And it might take a minute to even detect the fire with a smoke detector. Um, so you have to just account for a lot of the operational limitations of the system as well. So this is the design process that kind of goes through the contents of chapter four. It's not linear as with any design press process. You can't just kind of blast through the thing and be done with it. You have to keep going back and making sure that everything's lining up. So the first step is obvious, you know, determine if smoke control is even needed. Um, if you do need it, then you have to determine a design fire. So this depends on many factors, but basically you have to research the possible materials that are going to be in an occupancy. Um, so if it's a prison, a lot of times what we use is two mattresses and two uniforms, and that'll be the fuel for our fire. Um, and then you have to run a few design fires of different intensities in different places to determine the worst case scenario. Uh, for example, sometimes in an atrium, it's worse to have a fire to the side of the atrium rather than a fire right in the middle of the atrium just because of smoke production and um, the entrainment of the smoke up into the atrium can sometimes be worse if it's on the side. So after you get your design fire kind of, you find out the most conservative worst case scenario, the best thing to do is to get the AHJ to buy in to your design fire. Just so there aren't any surprises when it comes to acceptance testing or when it comes to permitting. Um, it's really important to get that kind of checked off. And of course, this can take several iterations of going back and forth with the AHJ and also going back and forth to your basis of design for the fire. Then what we're gonna do is propose a design solution. And this will use the approaches and design criteria. Um, you are then going to test it out with the calculations. And the solution needs to address all the criteria in the standard. And at this point, I would also recommend to document any assumptions you have because that's going to be really important in later steps. Um, so once you calculate, you have to check compliance. Um, and that has to do with everything, right? So all your velocities of the air coming in and out, um, the tenability requirements. It could fail if um, other issues such as plug holing and occupant evacuation time is too long and you can't maintain the tenability. And then once you kind of check the compliance, make sure it complies with all aspects of NFPA 92, 
then the next step is to coordinate with other members of the design team. And this is a big one um, because smoke control plays into so many other aspects of building design. You have architecture, you have to coordinate all the openings. If you have a giant grill for makeup there, you know, architects don't like that stuff. You have to make sure it's cool to put it in or that there's even space to put it in. Um, for mechanical, obviously, they have to supply the equipment in their design. So at least for me as a fire protection engineer, I don't do HVAC design. I have to work with them to make sure my equipment is put in at the right time. And then electrical has to make sure to provide power for it, especially backup power if that's required. So you've coordinated everything and now you have to document pretty much everything. We'll go over this a little bit more in later slides, um, but the documentation part of the design is a very critical um, and important step. And then last, we get to testing. And if everything passes, we're good. And if everything fails, you have to go back and get a new solution. So hopefully that does not happen. Oh my gosh. There we go. So just a quick overview of calculation techniques because this is talked about a lot on the design side. Um, hand calcs are what we typically refer to as the prescriptive calculations required by the code, so that like nine pages. That's what hand calcs are, and they're not really by hand. They're usually in a spreadsheet that you save and use like every time you get another one of these projects. Um, and then we have fire modeling software I don't know if anyone's familiar with this stuff, but these are a few basically industry accepted softwares that you can use to model fire either through zone modeling or computational fluid dynamics. Um, it's very important to have a trained professional who knows how to use this software. It's not just the kind of thing you can pick up off the street and read like FDS for dummies and figure out how to do on your own. You really need someone experienced at least supervising the software because garbage in, garbage out. You need to know the limitations and you need to be familiar with the physical, like the physics involved in fire dynamics in order to effectively use these tools. Um, and then you also need to make sure that it all complies with the requirements of NFPA 92 as well. It can be expensive if you don't get someone who knows what they're doing to work on these types of softwares. And then evacuation modeling, it adds a whole other level of complexity to a design. Um, basically what you're doing is calculating the amount of time that it takes for occupants in a building to exit the building and you apply a safety factor and then you say, okay, that's the amount of time that my smoke control system needs to be able to sustain a tenable environment so that everyone can safely get out. Um, there's lots of tools that you can use for evacuation modeling. There's even an add-in in FDS, which is one of the more um, popular, kind of widely known fire modeling softwares. Um, but again, you really need a trained professional to be able to use this software and it's also important that the AHJ is on board. Sometimes AHJs don't have the expertise to review these kinds of models or calculations, so they might engage a third-party reviewer who's you know, someone from another fire protection engineer from another company who's familiar with these kinds of designs that can then do a peer review and make sure that you're checking all your boxes, dotting all your I's and crossing your T's. So kind of the key concepts to understand about smoke control design is that there are many custom parameters that go into the design of a smoke control system. It's not like sprinkler or fire alarm where you just say, okay, here's the square footage, all right, I need a sprinkler every 200 square feet, every 140 square feet, whatever. You have to uniquely design it for the building geometry and for the, like, what's going on in the building, how many people there are going to be, what types of items are in there that might catch on fire. Um, for example, or so you also need an experienced designer who knows how to kind of point out all of those things and figure them out. Um, 
An example that I had was I took over a prison project from someone who left the company and I took it over. So I'm not gonna say the company or anything. Um, not trying to name names, but the basis of design document claimed that it was a containment system. Um, the design drawings did not show a containment system at all. And when I talked to the client, they actually needed a smoke management system. Um, because it was in a prison, the occupants couldn't evacuate and they needed to maintain tenability indefinitely. So the system that was originally designed wasn't going to do that. So going back to the flow chart, you have to have a documentation aspect as well. Um, chapter seven outlines the requirements of this report and we're gonna go over that in a couple of minutes. But basically once you're, design, once you're done with the design, you actually build the thing and then unlike some other standards, you don't have a prescriptive sequence of event for testing. Um, you don't have an overall this many CFM is required for a smoke control system to exhaust the building. So each smoke control system has unique parameters and the report is what defines how the acceptance testing needs to go. The report needs to include a write-up. Um, it'll have basically everything, the basis of design, design objectives, the approach, um, the design assumptions, so anything about ambient conditions, the interaction of other systems, is there cooling from sprinklers, the locations of the smoke control zones, um, design pressure differentials and their locations, especially for containment systems, that's really important, and also the limitations of the system. So for example, you have a shopping mall, and if the designer tried to put in a design fire for a car, like they, have, they roll the cars in and put them on display, if they ran models and calculations and found out that the smoke control system could not support a car on fire, then that needs to be documented in the report so that the AHJ and the owner knows, hey, you can't bring the car in here. It doesn't, it won't work. The smoke control system can't handle it. Um, so that needs to be included in the report. And then also the, the design calculations and qu equipment specifications. Um, for, I'm gonna try and skip ahead here. I think we lost some time, so. Basically, what you need to know is the design report, sorry. The design report is important compared to other standards. It dictates how the acceptance testing is going to go. Um, and it's more work for the designers, but that's okay. We like it, makes it interesting. Uh, so let's dive into the testing procedures required by NFPA 92. I know this is probably more um, what everyone is here for, so I don't wanna skimp on this too much. Um, some of these might be covered by the designer rather than the commissioning agent, um, but they all require AHJ witnessing or an AHJ to see the report that it was done correctly. Um, in most jurisdictions. Um, so first, before you do any component testing, you have to do physical inspection. And this is making sure the design is installed as required. Uh, this might be something that the design engineer of record takes care of as a part of their CA contract. So it's basically checking that smoke barriers, walls, dampers, fans, partitions, fire stopping is all in place and installed as it should be. And if this isn't complete, then the Testing basically has to stop there and they have to go back and fix it. Then you have component testing, which is pretty straightforward. You're just making sure that everything has power, the fans, dampers, relays, controls, and subsystems are all working properly, um, and you test their operation. After that, you go on to the acceptance testing, and this is the extensive part. This is where you need to test all the interactions of all the systems together. Um, if a system requires backup power, then you need to be testing that as well. So those are the, the four modes of testing are running on normal power, running on backup power, and then switching between the two. So running on normal power, then switching to backup, and then running on backup, the normal power comes back on, and switching to normal. Um, so those are the four modes. 
And then other testing requirements, you have to test door opening forces. This is a big one, especially for containment systems, because you have egress doors in zones that are pressurized. If people can't open the door to exit, then what's the point in even having a smoke control system in the first place? Um, so these forces will be, have to be in accordance with code. And if PA 101, the requirement is 15 pounds of force to open a latch, 30 pounds to start the door movement, and then 15 pounds to open it to the required egress width. Um, so for existing building, buildings, this can be up to 50 pounds to start the door moving, um, but that's not very common to retroactively install smoke control systems. If the door opening forces fail, one of the common fixes is to install a motor to assist in the opening, and I've been on a couple projects where they had to do that. Um, this is more common in large volume spaces too, but you can alleviate that by adding makeup air capacity. Um, maybe instead of 95%, you bump it up to 98 or 99% makeup air. You just don't wanna overshoot the exhaust with makeup air. Um, and then you have controls testing, which is both the automatic and manual operation of all the controls for the smoke control system. Um, and these have to be verified in accordance with the smoke control system's unique design um, in accordance with the Chapter 7 report. So Chapter 8 further breaks down testing into large volume spaces, which is basically smoke management, and also um, smoke containment systems. So for large volume spaces, first, the first step is to identify the perimeter of that large volume space. So it can be a little more subtle in modern buildings where you have lots of high-tech building equipment. Um, you might have curtains that come down rather than an actual partition, and you might be using airflow, like an air curtain, rather than a physical separation for separating the communicating space from the large volume area. So it can be tricky to identify this sometimes. I suggest looking at the architectural floor plans or the um, life safety plans should have the smoke zones on them. Um, and then once the smoke management system is activated, obviously verify all the operation of the fans, the dampers, the doors, and all related equipment. Then for measurements, you have to measure all the velocities through the openings, and the design report should list the maximum velocities allowable. Generally, it's limited to 200 feet per minute. However, it might be, have a lower limit in some designs, depending on the design fire. If you have a really limited geometry, you don't want the makeup air blowing the fire to another area and catching more stuff on fire. So basically, if you have a couch, you don't want the makeup air to blow the fire and ignite the chair next to the couch. Um, so the main, I guess the main thing to emphasize is just check the design report. It's basically going to tell you exactly what to do. Um, and you also, like another thing I didn't mention is door opening forces. You have to test those as well for um, large volume spaces. Yes? Is the revised standard going to have like, better defined parameters for like, what considered passing is? I mean, it's been arbitrated in eight days, very greatly. Yeah, so usually it goes with whatever the most conservative would be. So for example, if you have to have the outside door open, usually the outside door to the exit is always open, and then that will be the only door that's open. So if you fail on just that door being open, then you might be able to do a calculation and performance-based design and kind of justify, okay, well, there's gonna be this many doors open while people are evacuating, doing occupant load calc. But yeah, the 2018 version doesn't address that at all. There's only two changes to the code coming up and it, that's not one of them. So unfortunately, that's not going to be better in 2018. It's just gonna be more of the same. Oh. 
Okay. So I think that pretty much covers large volume spaces. Oh no. Um, so there are many more testing parameters for smoke containment systems. They tend to be more complicated because they cover larger areas than just a large volume space, which would encapsulate an atrium or an arena or an auditorium of some sort. Um, and they're kind of less understood as an active form of fire protection. So there are a bunch of different types kinds of smoke containment systems, the stairwell, elevator shaft, pressurization systems. Um, you could have lobbies or vestibules that are also pressurized, different smoke zones and areas of refuge, but they all include pressure testing and force testing. So pressure testing refers to the pressure differentials across the barriers, and these all need to be measured and recorded um, with all, interiors doors, all interior doors closed. Um, if an exterior door is normally open during evacuation, it shall be open during testing. So that's shall, not should. Shall means it's a code requirement. Should means it's just a best practice. So when you're reading in the code and it says shall, that means you have to do it. Um, also, the design report should list which door should be open. So kind of going back to the question back there, if the design report is performance-based design and it says, okay, all of these doors are going to be open for egress, then that's how many doors you can have open for the testing. So that kind of plays into another thing that I'm going to talk about a little bit later, but basically that design report with the testing section has to be submitted to the AHJ before you can even begin testing. And the AHJ has to approve it. That's part of the permitting process. So if you have a design that's done correctly, it should be no question by the time you get out to commissioning and there's, if there's any sort of question about which doors are open, then the design team has kind of failed. Yeah. Um, I recently commissioned a large arena in California and um, the AHJ wanted to generate smoke to prove that the smoke control system worked. Um, they did not understand <laughs> okay, but this is a, a very large gap in what is a very important system. Yeah, so that's part of what we try to do as designers too. Unfortunately, at least in my experience, a lot of times we get kind of value engineered out of the commissioning and the construction administration, like acceptance testing process. So if we're there, our role is to educate the fire marshal to make sure that they're doing things as we designed. A lot of times if you don't have as good of a designer or for whatever reason their budget gets cut and they're not there for the acceptance testing, you can run into a lot of problems. So that's another like great opportunity to engage a designer and just say like, hey, we need your help in educating, basically in educating the AHJ. Um, because you're right, like where I come from in DC, a lot of the AHJs are pretty sophisticated but not so much so in other areas that are a little more rural and you kind of have the same sort of situation where firemen get promoted to fire marshal and don't understand NFPA 92 as well. So that's a very good point. So I think we were on force testing at this point. Um, this has to do with opening forces on doors, which we already went over. Um, see what we can cut out. I know I'm short on time. Okay, so for each additional type of system, NFPA 92 does list the requirements in Chapter 8 on each specific system that are in those bottom bullet points there. Um, but 
commissioning people, you shouldn't have to know that. It should all be in the design report and it should be spelled out exactly what you need to do um, for ex acceptance testing. Um, the last few things that you need for closing out the testing, you need to test the firefighter control panel. Sometimes it's not in the same place or the same piece of equipment as the main fire alarm control panel, so it's not all integrated. You need to make sure that all the controls are tested so it can provide manual overrides. All the inputs and outputs for the fire control panel need to be tested. Um, and then documentation providing documentation that the testing was all completed to the design report and that it passed. It has all the pass-fail criteria outlined in the design report and everything passed. Um, and then at that point, you also, well, not you, but the installer would give the o and manual to the owner at that point. And then scheduling periodic testing is also important for the owner at least. Um, Dedicated systems have to be tested semi-annually, and then non-dedicated systems have to be tested annually. And then I'm going to skip over it a little bit, but Chapter 8 of 92 also lists everything you need to do in those annual and semi-annual tests. Um, basically, you kind of have to replicate certain parts of the acceptance testing, uh, mostly just measuring all of the um, the makeup air supply points and the exhaust, um, the exhaust points, and then also the pressure differentials across the barriers. Oh, another important thing to note is if you modify the building, such as the smoke barriers or any other part of the smoke control system, it all has to be retested for acceptance. Um, so that is another thing to note if there are a lot of changes in your building. Um, and just, I had a special note on live fire testing. It's not very common, but some jurisdictions do require it. I'm not a huge fan of it, just in general, because the only thing it really measures is visibility. It doesn't take into account any other aspects of tenability, such as um, temperature exposure or toxicity. So it's kind of like, as long as you know the exhaust is providing the capacity you need it to, then your calculations should show that that system is adequate. So, I know I already advanced the slide, but these are the important changes to know for the 2018 update of the code. Um, UUKL listing, um, besides being really hard to say, it's a separate listing under UL 864, which is the listing standard for fire alarm equipment. Um, and UUKL applies specifically to smoke control system equipment. Section 6.4.1 of NFPA 92 adopts this um, and requires smoke control equipment to be UUKL listed. So UL, just to kind of, I don't know how much everyone knows about it, but Underwriters Laboratories is a nationally recognized testing laboratory for various electronics and systems. Like you'll probably see their logo on your phone charger and on your lamp. Um, and then UL 864 is their standard for testing fire alarm. It has a very specific set of requirements and testing procedures that verify a piece of equipment for performing certain functions in a safe, reliable, and effective manner. Um, so buying fire alarm equipment without a UL listing or maybe FM listing, you are at a higher risk for the equipment to fail in the event of an emergency. So these are pretty much not optional. You have to have listed equipment or else no one's going to ensure your building. Um, so one of the requirements of UUKL is weekly testing. And that self-testing function is built into the panel and tested as a part of the listing process. So it basically just handshakes various components of the system and ensures that they're operating once a week. For non-dedicated systems, this can kind of mess up normal operations. Um, it might require a manual reset of the HVAC system or something to that effect. So the owners generally don't like this, despite its benefits that it can alert you earlier to um, a an equipment failure. So the 2012 version fully required all these UUKL weekly self-tests. The 2015 version of NFPA 92 removed this requirement. And then in 2018 is kind of a compromise between the two. 
it says you can, it, you now have to have the weekly testing function, but if individual components interfere with normal building operations, you can allow those to be bypassed as long as the AHJ approves it. Um, but it also kicks in a requirement. Rather than being tested annually, you now have to do a full test semi-annually. So before, when you could do only annual tests for a non-dedicated system, you now have to do that semi-annually. So it's kind of a trade-off, but I think everyone was kind of happy with that compromise, both sides of the regulators and the owners. And then the last change, these are the only two changes really to the entire code, um, all 27 pages. An appendix was added at the end that addresses tenability. And it's mostly gonna be a tool to aid design. So it's for the designers, not so much commissioning and testing, but it might affect certain parts of the commissioning process depending on the parameters for measurement. Um, this mostly has to do with um, if you have like a live smoke test or something, what exactly you will have to measure during that test. Um, but again, it's mainly a tool for designers and this will hopefully change the tenability cutoffs and make them more consistent across jurisdictions. So it solves one of the problems that you might see out there, but it's mostly on the design side rather than the testing. Um, and just to kind of wrap, it, wrap everything up and tie it together, I don't know if everyone can read the writing on here, but everyone's probably familiar with at least the concept of this chart. So as time goes on, the influence over cost for a project go down drastically, and the cumul cumulative project costs go up a lot. Um, therefore, the later that changes have to be made, the more they're going to cost and the less you're going to be able to rein in those costs. So by the time smoke control is in the commissioning process, it's really too late to have any sort of control over those costs and whatever needs to be changed is going to cost a lot of money in time, in rework and coordination. So for any owners out there, that's why it's really important to have a designer and an installer who are familiar with smoke control systems and know the requirements of NFPA 92 or else you can really get into a death spiral in this chart. So thank you very much for your time. Uh, my contact info is above. I know we were kind of cut short due to some technical difficulties. So if you have any questions you wanna shoot me offline, feel free to write down my email or I think it's also on the app. It's pretty cool. Um, and I don't, do we have time for questions? Okay. What about smoke testing? I've seen tests done with cold smoke for no heat source. And other testers that come in and say you have to have hot smoke. Is there any requirement in yeah, so NFPA 92 doesn't cover that. It's going to depend on the AHJ first and foremost, and then also if there are explicit instructions from the designer in the design report that you need to provide hot or cold smoke for the... I mean, I'm pretty sure a designer is not going to tell you to test that, but it's going to be based on the AHJ's requirements. Is it very typical for a design report to be generated, or does that need out like you It's technically a requirement. So you can't really have a smoke control system <laughs> without a without a report. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, two quick questions. Uh, when you m make up air to an exhaust system in a smoke management <coughs> system, does that introduce oxygen? And what are the considerations for maybe increasing a fire with make up air? So the point of the make up air is typically you, you can't exhaust the smoke fast enough without it. Um, there are concerns that it can add oxygen to the fire, but studies have shown that it's far better to have you know, air circulating through the fire because it's going to protect the building from smoke damage, it's going to protect the occupants from smoke inhalation. Um, it might take a little longer for the fire to burn out, but if it's an isolated fuel source, then hopefully it does that on its own. 
or a sprinkler will activate or the fire department will get there. So really it is the main concern with makeup air is that you don't want to blow it directly on the fire. Um, so for design fires, you need to take that into account. And also as a design, when you're designing the makeup air, it's better to have multiple inlets rather than just one giant grill with a fan just blasting like 200 feet per minute of air in there, you want to get a bunch of smaller fans because coming from multiple different directions because that'll mean less velocity. Great. Uh, second quick question. Could you address maybe the liability of a commissioning authority or commissioning agent doing these tests as far as on fire safety, uh, life safety systems? Is there any liability on our part? Um, so I don't I don't know the answer to that. I can probably reach back. If you want to give me your business card, we have a lot of experts who also deal with like NFPA 3 and 4 um, who would probably know the answer to that question at my company. So if you want to just give me your business card or shoot me an email, I can get back to you. So technically, the is design? That, is that in the design documents? Yeah, it needs to be in the design documents as a part of the permit. So it should be so in there with the all the other. Are in the specifications. It should be with, you know, when you have all the mechanical calculations and electrical calculations, the design report should be included in that document, like your project document folder. It should all be there, giant binder. Um, it's probably going to be separate from the specs, just because those are typically, you know, like master spec and it's all formatted. It's is something that goes through the, to the contractor? It needs to go through to the AHJ. Correct. The, the contractor ultimately has to execute mm -hmm. the commissioning, so how do they obtain? Yeah, they should get that as well. They should get the, pro the whole project man manual. That's what they're bidding on, hopefully, um, except for maybe in a design build project. But they should get that entire project manual before they even start working on a job. Uh -huh. well, Normally what you see is a specification and a set of drawings. You're saying it's a separate document beyond that? Yeah, it needs to be part of the project manual. And I know it, it doesn't always happen that way, but really the contractor is supposed to get that. Yeah, that's a failure on the part of the whoever's issuing the bid documents. They need to be including that information. Thank you, everyone.